have one run rack uh, with DOCSIS 3.1, an overview, part one and two, and we're going to have a tea break in between at uh, 3.45, so um, Ron's promised me um, it's going to be quite a heavy session for us. So, um, I think we all know Ron, but uh, Ron has been in the cable industry since 1972 and is the technical leader for Cisco Systems Cable Access Business Unit. In this role, Ron represents Cisco on a variety of industry standards and specification development subcommittee and working groups, providing a high-level engineering support to Cisco customers and works with new business developments, marketing and product development team. Ron's industry, in, industry activities include the publication of hundreds of articles and papers. He was inducted into the Cable TV Pioneers in 1997, awarded the US SCT ISBE Members of the Year in 2004, and was co-recipient of the SCT ISBE Chairman Award in 2006. During the Cable Expo, Cable Tech Expo, beg your pardon, 2010, Ron was inducted into the SCT ISBE Hall of Fame. He was the first American to be elected an honorary fellow in the SCT, the Society for, for, for Broadband Professionals, the highest graded membership in the, that organization. Ron was a recipient of the 2016 Tom, Award, Tom Hall Award for Outstanding Services to Broadband Engineering. Ron, over to you. Thank you very much. Is this, is this thing working yet? It's working? You can hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay, John, I have something for you. I'm going to be talking about OFDM, or the word orthogonal. He has the trademark on that since it's, a, it's based in Greek. So here, pass this coin down to John. That's the, that's the royalty payment for orthogonal. How many of you know John? <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Well, now the, the trick is to continue to try to keep you awake this afternoon. Uh, Paul, thank you for the, uh, the very kind introduction. I'm going to talk this afternoon about DOCSIS 3.1, a subject of interest, I suspect, to most of you. Some of you may have even been playing around with this technology. But I'll begin the presentation with an overview of uh, the history of DOCSIS. So let's see here. This button should move the slides, which it does. DOCSIS has been around for a while. The spec for the first version of DOCSIS was published in the late 1990s, and it gave us what we call interoperability. Um, those of you who have played with computers a long time may remember the days when you had a dial-up modem on your computer to access your favorite service provider. And in the, the beginning, a, a company called Hayes Microcomputer Products came up with a, what became a de facto standard for dial-up modems. And then the competitors came out with so-called Hayes-compatible modems. And as long as, let's say, your computer used a Hayes-compatible modem and your service provider used a Hayes-compatible modem, you had interoperability for the most part. So your computer and modem could communicate with the, the modem um, at the service provider. We call that interoperability. Before DOCSIS, cable modem technology was based on proprietary um, technology from different manufacturers. So if you bought one manufacturer's head-end equipment, you had to use that same manufacturer's cable modems. You couldn't use another vendor's products. Uh, that changed when DOCSIS was introduced in the late 1990s, and 1.0 gave us this, this ability to have what we call interoperability. And I know the laser on this thing's not real, not real good. How many of you remember the the uh, the movie Crocodile Dundee? <laughs> remember when they got they got mugged with the guy at knife point and he says that's that's not a knife. This is a knife. But, okay. Well, this is a laser pointer here. <laughs> so what we have then with DOCSIS 1.0 is that certified cable modems will work with qualified cable modem termination systems. That's what DOCSIS 1.0 gave us. It also gave us the ability to transmit one downstream single carrier QAM channel from the CMTS to the cable modem. Six megahertz in the case of the, the North American operation and eight megahertz for, for Eurodoxis. And in the upstream, we were limited to one, one channel of varying bandwidths, but the typical bandwidth that cable operators chose was either 1.6 megahertz or 3.2 megahertz. 
Most operators started with 64 QAM. Um, and as, as Jeff uh, noted earlier in his presentation, there were some concerns as the cable industry started to move to 256 QAM in the downstream and then in the upstream from QPSK to 16 QAM. Um, but all of this was done in the world of DOCSIS 1.0. 1.1 came along and added a little bit of robustness um, in, in the form of, of a, uh, a defined adaptive pre-equalization in the return path to compensate for the effects of micro-reflections and so on. But mostly what DOCSIS 1.1 gave us was some features that enabled us to do things like voice over cable. You know, quality of service, better <coughs> scheduling, packet classification, and, and so on. The... Uh, Technology under the umbrella of what we call DOCSIS 1.x, 1.0, 1.1, .1, supported raw data rates, that's from the CMTS to the cable modem, of 30.34 megabits per second with 64 QAM and 42.88 megabits per second with 256 QAM, where QAM is an abbreviation for quadrature amplitude modulation. A whole bunch of upstream data rates from 320 kilobits per second to as high as 10.24 megabits per second. Now understand these are raw data rates. When you take out the overhead and, and whatnot, it, it knocks those numbers down just a little bit. And I mentioned already the, uh, the eight tap adaptive prequalization to, uh, to help compensate to, for the presence of micro reflections in the cable network. And there's the table that I will not read. I will let you read through that if you like. That summarizes the channel bandwidths and symbol rates and data rates and, and so on with uh, DOCSIS 1.x in the upstream. Well, then along came DOCSIS 2.0. And it wasn't, it, this was introduced not too long after DOCSIS 1.1 came along. The downstream stayed pretty much the same as it was with the earlier versions of DOCSIS, which was fine. What DOCSIS 2.0 brought was an increase in throughput in the return path from the cable modem back to the head end. And it did this a couple ways. One was to increase the channel bandwidth in the return path, so the maximum channel bandwidth went from 3.2 megahertz to 6.4 megahertz. But it also added some additional modulation orders. With DOCSIS 1.x, we had QPSK and 16 QAM. When DOCSIS 2.0 was introduced, along came 8 QAM, 32 QAM, 64 QAM, and if you used something called SCDMA, which hardly anybody did, um, 128 QAM with trellis-coded modulation. But the, the throughput was the same uh, with 128 QAM as it was with 64 QAM and TDMA, or as it was called in DOCSIS 2.0, advanced TDMA, or time division multiple access. Even though it was all, it was all time division multiple access, it was the idea that ATDMA was, was the uh, supposed DOCSIS 2.0 version. It was just a way to differentiate it from the earlier versions. That's all. So that's a little bit of the history on that. Um, but in the upstream, we can get up to 30.72 megabits per second. Uh, same frequency usage as before. There are the data rates I talked about. But when you look at this and say, wait a minute, we're going from QPSK and 16 QAM to as high as 64 QAM. Cable operators, in some cases, struggled, but certainly um, faced the challenges of moving from QPSK to 16 QAM in the upstream. And I remember the discussions with a lot of cable operators. That, yeah, you can make this work. But in order to make it work, of course, the data transmission has to be a bit more robust. And under the umbrella of something called advanced PHI, or advanced physical layer, DOCSIS 2.0 introduced some, some cool improvements in the return path data transmission that actually helped us to support 64 QAM in the return path and 32 QAM if you wanted to do it. But frankly, my answer was, look, if you're going to do 32 QAM, you might as well go ahead and just do 64 QAM and get the, the total throughput. So this thing called advanced PHI included an improved adaptive pre-equalizer in the return path. So it went from 8-tap pre-equalization to 24-tap pre-equalization, which means that, that in the return path, the pre-equalization process could compensate for even more severe micro-reflections caused by impedance mismatches in our networks. Um, the forward error correction um, improved. It went from uh, T equals 10 up to T equals 16 in the return path, so, so that really helped. Uh, it also added programmable byte interleaving, which did not exist in the earlier versions of DOCSIS. Ingress cancellation, direct sampled um, um, RF in the burst receiver, and so on. By the way, the ingress cancellation was not actually defined in DOCSIS 2.0. It basically said... Okay, if you want to do ingress cancellation, it's going to be a proprietary thing, so 
Um, Texas Instruments and, and Broadcom had their own implementations of ingress cancellation, which actually worked quite well. So this is kind of the history of, of the uh, 2.0 and earlier versions of DOCSIS. But of course, not being content with what this brought us, the cable industry said, we want more. We want more throughput. So how do we get more throughput out of DOCSIS? Well, that was introduced with DOCSIS 3.0, which brought us the concept of channel bonding. Now, it's important to understand that with channel bonding, we're not actually gluing together all of these individual QAM signals into one giant QAM signal for transport through our networks. Instead, the bonding is logical. And the data is spread among multiple individual QAM channels in either the forward path or the return path. So we, we increase data throughput. So for example, four bonded downstream channels might produce a, data a usable data capacity in excess of 100 megabits per second. Um, the RF spectrum was increased to one gigahertz in the forward path and up to uh, 85 megahertz optionally in the return path. Um, backwards compatibility, this has been an important part of DOCSIS uh, that, that, that exists even today with DOCSIS 3.1. It's very, very, very important that DOCSIS provide backwards compatibility so cable operators aren't forced to have to go out and, and remove all of the old devices and put in all brand new devices. As much as the vendor community might like that, the cable operators have told us in no uncertain terms that the DOCSIS, various versions of DOCSIS will ensure backwards compatibility um, so they can reside on the same system. So here's an example in the DOCSIS upstream. We can see multiple bonded channels. They're actually individual channels but the data payload is spread across those multiple channels. Same thing in the downstream. Um, as far as the uh, modulation orders and channel bandwidths and so on, all that stayed the same as, as it did with DOCSIS 2.0. So uh, the, the big improvement here was the, the ability to bond multiple channels and to carry data across multiple channels. And, and today some operators are doing bonding um, of as many as 32 downstream channels to the cable modem and, and four, five, six, eight channels in the return path. Uh, depends on the operator, depends on the available RF bandwidth in the, in the return path, but the, uh, the data speeds are, are certainly much greater. I've got a DOCSIS 3.0 modem at my house, and the, the downstream data rate from the server at, at Comcast subsite is, is about 90 megabits per second to the house, and the upstream is around you know, five and a half to six megabits per second. And, um, Works very well, it, uh, as advertised, and is particularly nice for downloading big files. As far as you know, routine email and checking a web page or something, I really don't see a lot of difference. But oh, and downloading files and updates to Microsoft and stuff, they just come through like that. So that's that's a real plus for for DOCSIS 3.0. But here too, it's not enough. The old saying: if 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 we build it, they will come. Well, in this case, the uh, the uh, competition has really forced the cable industry to pursue even higher data speeds in our networks. And we do that now with DOCSIS 3.1. This is the latest data over cable service interface specifications. The first version of this spec was released in October of 2013. The latest version is I09, which was published in June of this year. So you can see that there have been a few upgrades and changes to the, to the spec um, even in just the last couple of years. Most of those are editorial changes. A few, a few are technical clarifications on certain parameters that are in the spec. And sometimes somebody finds a, whoops, we can't, this, this won't actually work the way it's worded, so those things get fixed. But these versions clean, these new versions clean those things up. All the 3.1 specs, including the MAC and upper layer protocols interface spec, also known as MULPI, um, the cable modem OSSI stuff, the PHI spec, this is, this is part of uh, what I was involved with. As, a, as one of the Cisco reps on the, the FI working group. Um, CCAP, all these have been publicly released, and you can get all these specs um, on the Cable Labs website. There's no charge for them. You go to the Cable Labs website, click on a window, I think, or a menu item at the top that says specifications, search, and then you can pull up DOCSIS 3.1 and, and download it. And if I recall, the, uh, the FI spec is something like 280 pages 200, 280 pages. The multi spec is something like seven or 800 pages. So there's a, they're, they're big documents. If you have trouble sleeping, uh, reading through any of these will take care of that. Um, good news here, DOCSIS 3.1 became an international standard in December of 2014 under, uh, under the auspices of Etsy. All right, well, 
why not just continue with DOCSIS 3.0? After all, if you think about the concept of channel bonding, you can just keep adding more and more channels to increase the usable throughput. And indeed, DOCSIS 3.0 can scale to gigabit class services. However, DOCSIS 3.1, with the various technologies that it uses, can scale more efficiently and is more spectrally efficient. This is a particularly um, important thing to keep in mind uh, when compared to, now we have this new term, SCQAM, or Single Carrier Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. And of course, the reason for that is to, to differentiate these little 6 megahertz or 8 megahertz wide QAM haystacks, as we like to call them, from the, the, uh, the DOCSIS 3.1 signals that use this new name for us, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. And uh, I just I paid my royalty for the, the Greek part of that to, uh, to John. Um, and then, of course, here's the, uh, here's the marketing piece from Cable Labs on this. So. But, the, but the reality is we can scale to even, uh, even bigger bigger throughput numbers and, and do, do so while being more spectrally efficient in our network. So that's a pretty cool part. So the goals, when the, uh, the 3.1 spec was being developed, the goals included scalability to 10 gigabits per second or more in the downstream direction, one gigabit per second or more in the upstream direction. And as I said, a better spectral efficiency and, of course, the backwards compatibility with <coughs> earlier versions of DOCSIS. 3.1 introduces some new physical layer technology. This is where the big changes are, is in the physical layer. We get these new abbreviations, at least for us. They're, they're not new abbreviations per se in the world of technology, but they're new for the cable industry. OFDM, OFDMA, LDPC, expanded downstream and upstream um, spectral usage, better energy efficiency, and some, some fun little tidbits here to take away. All of this will allow DOCSIS 3.1 to give us the ability to be competitive with fiber to the home. Even more important is what I've got highlighted in the, the red rectangle here. DOCSIS 3.1 is deployable on today's HFC networks. You do not have to go out and rebuild or upgrade your network. You can deploy it today. And in fact, as you heard earlier today, some operators have already started some limited deployments. Many operators are also involved in, in uh, pre-deployment trials and tests to see just how well these, this OFDM stuff works on the cable plants. So what do these abbreviations mean? OFDM is orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. OFDMA is the upstream version of that, orthogonal frequency division multiple access. Better spectral efficiency than single carrier QAM, and I've said that two or three times, and I'll continue to emphasize that and show why that's important here a little bit later. Better forward error correction. We get this thing called LDPC, or low density parity check, which uh, interestingly was, uh, was introduced um, as a concept back in about 1960, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later on in the, uh, the presentation. Um, LDPC is a more powerful form of forward error correction than the Reed-Solomon forward error correction that's used in DOCSIS 3.0 and earlier. Now, to be fair, Reed-Solomon is very, very good. It's a very, very um, effective form of forward error correction. We've been using it for quite some time, but LDPC is even better. Um, here's something else that's interesting. Time and frequency interleaving to help improve transmission robustness. Right now, we use time, time domain interleaving in earlier versions of DOCSIS, but with 3.1, we expand that to include frequency domain interleaving, which really um, provides the ability to, to live in the presence of some pretty nasty impairments in the, in the plant. Higher modulation orders, up to 4,096 QAM or 4K QAM in the uh, downstream and upstream, and optional and you thought you had headaches when you were going from 64 QAM to 256 QAM in the downstream, optional support to 16,384 QAM. Imagine looking at the Constellation display on your test equipment at that. We call that 16K QAM. It just, just doesn't take as much time to say. The 16,384 quadrature amplitude modulation, so 16K QAM. I mentioned the expanded downstream and upstream RF spectrum usage. The mandatory part is that the DOCSIS technology must support 258 megahertz as a start frequency 
uh, up to 1,218 megahertz. So 258 megahertz to one, roughly 1.2 gigahertz, optional to 1,794 megahertz or roughly 1.8 gigahertz in the downstream, and with an optional start frequency of 108 megahertz on the lower end uh, versus 258. Upstream, 5 megahertz to 85 megahertz, that's mandatory, um, optional to as high as 204 megahertz, and then some intermediate steps that I'll talk about a little bit later on. And then there's this really cool thing called multiple modulation profiles, different modulation orders, sorry, for different cable modems. Now, if you think about the way our networks are today, we're kind of limited, um, limited by the least common denominator, at least that's a good way to think about it. Let's say that your network is pretty old and in you know, need, of, need of some upgrade or repair or something, and you can only do 64 QAM in, in parts of the network because of the plant conditions. Well, that means that everybody has to get 64 QAM because you can't transmit 256 QAM um, and, two, and 64 QAM on the same channel at the same time to different customers because of different plant conditions at different houses, say, in the same node service area. So we have to use that, that least common denominator. So in that case, 64 QAM would be it. With multiple modulation profiles, we can, in fact, transmit multiple modulation orders simultaneously to different customers in different parts of the, of the uh, node service area or different parts of the network. That is a really powerful capability um, to be able to optimize the throughput um, to match the conditions of the plant um, in your cable network. Downstream RF transmit power. Um, now, you notice I use this term CTA channel. This, this has very, variously been known as the... EIA channels and CEA channels, but it's now called CTA channels. That's the 6 megahertz channel plan because the 3.15 spec defines such things as, as OFDM channel power in terms of the power in a 6 megahertz chunk of the OFDM signal. That's the channel power. And then you want to figure out the total power, then it's the standard 10, 10 log um, plus uh, N, where N is the number of, of uh, CTA channel slots or 6 megahertz channel slots, and that gets you the, the total power of the OFDM signal. There's the math for it. For those of you who may have forgotten or wanted to forget, the seal is a, an abbreviation for sealing. It's a sealing function. I'm not going to go through how this works. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. But this is the math that, that says, okay, this is how you calculate downstream OFDM channel power. You know, the easy way to remember it, you set the OFDM haystack height to be the same power spectral density as your single carrier QAM channels. In other words, if you're looking on a spectrum analyzer, you see your QAM channels on there, set the OFDM signal to be the same height on the spectrum analyzer. That's all that means. Input to the cable modem, total input power must be less than 40 dBmV. The signal level range, minus 9 dBmV. And of course, for those of you who live in the world of dB microvolt, there's the conversion between dBmV and uh, dB mu, mu V, or dB microvolt and dB millivolt. So minus 9 to plus 21 dBmV. And then you see this in a 24 megahertz occupied bandwidth. The reason for that is that it gives the equivalent power spectral density to the minus 15 dBmV to plus 15 dBmV per 6 megahertz in single carrier QAM. So there's all these equivalents uh, in there, but with all the, all the math and the examples that, that show why these things are, in fact, included in the spec. All right, well, let's talk about OFDM. How many of you know what OFDM is, besides an abbreviation for orthogonal frequency division multiplexing? Say a hand over here, a couple over here that know what OFDM is. What orthogonal is, besides the fact I had to pay John uh, some, some money for... Uh, I have to support the Greek economy, yeah, the Greek economy <laughs> there. Uh, it, uh, yeah, anyway, we won't go there. All right, so a few of you know what it is. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about this, this concept of FDM, frequency division multiplexing, and then add the orthogonal to it and, and uh, try to convey what this orthogonal stuff is all about and what it means, and, and, uh, when, and then hopefully... With the graphics that you see on some of the slides, you go, oh, okay, that's what they mean by orthogonal in this case. Cable networks have, since the 1940s, when the industry started, used frequency division multiplexing, FDM. What that means is that each signal we carry in the network is assigned to its own channel slot. That's all it means. The over-the-air broadcast industry does the same thing. The UHF television broadcasters use FDM so that different transmitters use different frequencies. That's frequency division multiplexing, FDM. So each RF signal is on its own frequency or assigned to its own channel slot. So here we can see a spectrum analyzer screenshot that shows some analog TV signals 
and what I've labeled digital signals, but they're really analog signals. That, you knew that, right? Yeah. We don't actually carry digital signals on our networks. They're all analog. Those QAM signals are really analog. Just wanted to mention that. Anyway, here's what they look like on a spectrum analyzer. Note, this, this signal's got its own channel. This signal's got its own channel. This signal's got its own channel. This one has its own channel, and so on. This allows multiple signals to use the same transmission medium, a piece of coax, at the same time. That is all FDM is. Okay, we got that out of the way. Now we have to figure out what this O for orthogonal has to do with all of this. Okay, well, I said earlier that OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, is used in DOCSIS 3.1. And in particular, OFDM is used in the downstream. And in this application, up to 7,600 little narrow bandwidth subcarriers, each of which is really a miniature QAM signal, make up one OFDM channel. So each of these little subcarriers, or little miniature QAM signals, carries a tiny percentage of the total data payload at a very low rate. And then when you add them all together, you get the aggregate data throughput of the entire OFDM channel. Now, in the upstream, we use something called OFDMA, orthogonal frequency division multiple access. And this gives us the ability to more efficiently use that return path because think of it as, as kind of a two-dimensional use of the return path, frequency domain use and time domain use. That becomes a pretty powerful tool in uh, transmission from multiple modems simultaneously. Today, with TDMA, one modem at a time talks. So if I'm the CMTS, I say, got any data for me? Send it back, say, okay, your turn, you send it, then you send your data, you send your data, you send your data, and so on. So it's one at a time. With OFDMA, you, 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 you can send your signals back at the same time. Very powerful way of doing things. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that um, a little later on. All right, I've said earlier that OFDM is new to cable, but it's not new as a technology. And that's kind of an advantage for us because we can use the chip and silicon technology that has been developed for applications in LTE and Wi-Fi and DAB and MOCA and all these other things that have been using Wi-Fi or, or some variation, not of Wi-Fi, but of, of, uh, of OFDM for some time. So just new for us on our cable networks, just not new technology uh, as a technology goes. So here's another way to look at it graphically. In the upper left part of this slide, you can see these little green shapes here that represent our individual single carrier QAM channels. This could be a six megahertz channel or an eight megahertz channel, but each signal is assigned its own frequency slot. In the case of OFDM, we have a channel of some width, and within that we have a whole bunch of these little subcarriers, little narrow subcarriers, each of which, as I mentioned, is a QAM signal. But look at something else on the screen here. Notice that these little subcarriers actually overlap each other. And you think, wait a minute, Ron clearly needed more coffee when he was creating the graphic for this slide. How can you have QAM signals overlap and not interfere with each other? Because in the world of single carrier QAM, if this one overlapped with this one, neither one would work. But with OFDM, they overlap by about 50%. And they work without interference because they are orthogonal to one another. And I'll touch on what this orthogonal thing is here in a moment. Uh, with OFDM, we don't have to deal with 6 megahertz wide channel limitations or 8 megahertz wide channel limitations anymore. We can make the channel with anything we want. Because remember, that channel is made up of a whole bunch of those little small subcarriers that are overlapping. So we can make it pretty much any size we like. Within the DOCSIS 3.1 phi spec, one will find the requirements for channel bandwidth. The minimum encompassed spectrum in the downstream is 22 megahertz. The minimum encompassed spectrum, or the maximum encompassed spectrum is 190 megahertz. And you say, well, wait a minute, didn't, didn't we just hear earlier that, that 
the OFDM is 192 megahertz max and, nine, and 24 minimum. Okay, th those are occupied bandwidths. If you read through the physical layer spec, you'll hear all these, these strange terms like occupied bandwidth and, and encompassed spectrum. So the, uh, the occupied bandwidth includes the encompassed spectrum plus what's called the taper regions. Uh, think of it as kind of the spillover from the, the edges of the, of the subcarriers. In other words, how sharp or how, how much roll off there is or isn't at the edges of the channel. So this is the, the spec. It says, all right, the, the channel bandwidths go from 24 to 192 megahertz. You might wonder why those numbers were chosen. They're both divisible by 8 and 6. So there's no need for a separate DOCSIS 3.1 spec called Euro DOCSIS 3.1. One spec fits everything because it works with 8 and 6 megahertz channel spacing. Um, Minimum encompass spectrum in the upstream is 6.4 megahertz, um, and then uh, to a maximum of 95 megahertz. If you toss in the, the uh, taper regions, then this goes to 96 megahertz. So you'll see some of these numbers in, uh, in here um, a little bit later on, too. If you've ever wondered what an OFDM signal looks like on a spectrum analyzer, there it is. In this case, it's 96 megahertz wide, and you can see here that it looks kind of like a QAM haystack that you'd see for a regular DOCSIS 3.0 or 2.0 or 1.0 or um, single carrier QAM. But as you look at this, it's got um, a few things poking up out of the top. You'll notice these little spikes that are spaced periodically all across the channel. Those are called pilots. And they're a very, very necessary part of the OFDM signal in order for this whole process to work and to maintain orthogonality. And you'll also see that there's this little thing sort of in the middle, not quite in the middle, but there's almost, almost looks like a little pile of noise right there. That's called the physical layer link channel or phi link channel or PLC. And I'll talk a bit more about that a little later on too because that's a real critical piece of the OFDM signal that the cable modem has to lock, find and lock onto and demodulate in order to get all of the physical layer information about what's going on uh, with the, uh, the DOCSIS 3.1 operation. So there's what this thing looks like on a spectrum analyzer. And I mentioned earlier that the subcarriers overlap each other. Um, they don't interfere with each other, at least they're not supposed to. And it just kind of seems, oh, wait a minute, that's how do you overlap these RF signals and not get interference? Well, it's because they're orthogonal. Now in this case, orthogonal means that the subcarriers are independent such that there is no interaction between them despite the overlap in frequency. Okay, but how does that happen? Well, one of the, the key, key, key parts to making this work and having this thing called orthogonality as, is that the subcarriers have exactly an integer number of cycles in the symbol period or symbol interval. Most of us who work in HFC networks like to think in terms of the frequency domain, what we see on a spectrum analyzer. And in fact, the, the graphics that I've shown so far illustrate um, examples of this OFDM signal in the frequency domain. But in the world of DOCSIS 3.1, and in particular OFDM, we have to start thinking in the time domain too. So I'm going to show some graphics that illustrate what the subcarriers look like in the time domain and... and what the corresponding subcarriers look like in the frequency domain. And as long as those relationships are maintained, then we have orthogonality and they don't interfere with each other. So here's a, a frequency domain graphic representation of several subcarriers. And I've got each one um, shown as a different color so that you can see um, where each subcarrier is and where all these little side lobes are. And as you look at this, you can see a few things. First of all, there's the spacing between the subcarriers. And here I call it 1 over TU, um, where TU is the, the uh, useful symbol duration. So you take the reciprocal of the symbol duration, which can be either 20 microseconds or 40 microseconds. So if you take the reciprocal of either of those two numbers, you get the subcarrier spacing. And in DOCSIS 3.1, it's either 25 kilohertz or 50 kilohertz. And the subcarrier spacing happens to also equal the width of the subcarriers. Now, remember I said they're little narrow, itty-bitty qualm signals. Well, they are. They're either 25 kilohertz wide or they're 50 kilohertz wide. And there's something else that you look at 
here in the frequency domain, which is one reason you don't get the interference, is note that with these subcarriers that overlap, the peak of one subcarrier lines up with the nulls of the other subcarriers. And as long as these guys do that, they don't interfere with each other. We'll touch for a moment on this frequency domain versus time domain concept. How many of you have played around with a spectrum analyzer? Okay, look, look, looks like most of you have used a spectrum analyzer at one time or another. How about an oscilloscope? So most of you have done that too. If you take an oscilloscope and a spectrum analyzer to look at the same signal, what you see on the screens are quite different, even though you're looking at the same signal. In the left-hand side of, of the slide here, you can see an oscilloscope display of a sine wave. That is an unmodulated signal. We'll just assume this is an unmodulated RF carrier, a CW or continuous wave carrier, right here in the time domain. And I say the time domain because the horizontal axis of the display is in units of time. The vertical axis is amplitude or magnitude. On the spectrum analyzer, we see the same signal, but here the horizontal axis is frequency. Vertical axis is still amplitude or magnitude. So notice that our CW carrier, this thing right here, is, pops up as a little spike in the frequency domain. Same signal, just different ways of looking at, at them. And if you wanted to visualize it another way, and I don't have a graphic that shows this, but just try to visualize this in your mind. Imagine that you're looking at our CW carrier sideways from the side. And if you rotate around 90 degrees and look at it from the end, what do you see? You see this little spike. That's a way to visualize time versus frequency. I am going to skip through the FFT part. <laughs> I'll mention a couple things. Um, the, the fast Fourier transform, or FFT, and is, is just a, a fast way to compute something called the discrete Fourier, Fourier transform, or the, the DFT. It's a whole lot faster. Um, you say, well, why am I even mentioning this if I'm going to skip it? Well, it's because DOCSIS 3.1 technology uses FFT and, and the inverse of that, IFFT, in order to, uh, to do some pretty nifty things, like, like create and transmit all these subcarriers and then receive and demodulate them on the other end, whether it's downstream or upstream. It uses this FFT stuff. Uh, but I just want to mention that. So think of it this way. The discrete Fourier transform, or fast Fourier transform, is used to break down a complex signal into a bunch of individual sine waves. So we use this in the receiver. And the inverse of that just takes a whole bunch of sine waves and sums them together to construct a complex signal. That's used in a transmitter, transmitter or modulator. That's all you need to know about FFT. And I've got a bunch of slides in here that talk about this matrix bit, but I won't, I'm, not, I'll, I'm gonna skip through those because that's, that's one of those things that is really not a good subject to discuss after lunch. Even if it's a couple hours after lunch, it's, well, this thing is wanting to jump ahead by itself unless I'm doing that. Remember our, our discussion about needing to have an, an, an exactly an integer number of cycles in the symbol period? That's in the time domain. So look at the left-hand graphic here. And I've got these, these subcarriers color-coded. So what we have over here is the frequency domain, where you can see the subcarriers, much like you'd see them on a spectrum analyzer. Here are the same subcarriers in the time domain, much like you'd see on an oscilloscope. Same signals. See the different colors represent the different subcarriers, but just a different way to look at them. On the left, the horizontal axis is the time domain axis, like you'd see on an oscilloscope. So from this point to this point is our symbol period, 20 microseconds or 40 microseconds. So we're just looking at a 20 microsecond or 40 microsecond window of time. Within that symbol period time, we have to have, in order to maintain orthogonality, exactly an integer number of cycles. If you don't, then you wind up with a situation where these things start to 
lose their alignment in the frequency domain, and now you get interference. So let's take a look at our lowest frequency subcarrier. It starts here, the beginning of our symbol period, and we've got this one kind of light blue sine wave. And just to simplify it, I just show one sine wave in the symbol period. That corresponds to the lowest frequency subcarrier in the frequency domain. Next is the green one, so we've got one, two cycles in that symbol period. That's our second highest frequency subcarrier. Number three is the red one, so there's one, two, three cycles, exactly three cycles in that symbol period. That's our middle frequency subcarrier. Then we have the purple one, so there's one, two, three, four subcarriers in that period. That gives us our fourth subcarrier in the frequency domain, and then there's this darker blue one. It's one, two, three, four, five. And there's our fifth subcarrier up here. As long as those relationships are maintained with OFDM, you have orthogonality, and they do not interfere with each other. And what does this tell you? Well, it tells you that things like frequency and phase of these subcarriers are extremely critical. There is just no wiggle room for drift of the phase or the frequency because if that happens with these subcarriers, then we lose orthogonality and these subcarriers interfere with each other and things are a real mess. That's where the O in orthogonal comes from. See why I gave you that coin? Isn't that good? What's that? You can't have more money now. That's all you get. Well, I'm sure the next speaker today will give you a coin as well, right? Oh, wait a minute. There is no next speaker today. <laughs> I'm giving John a bad time because we... Well, too. Yeah. And most, well, yeah, most of you know him, I guess. So, so you're probably thinking, yeah, Ron, give him even more bad time. This is, this is good. Okay, I'm going to get past this, uh, this part here on the, the FFT and stuff, but it's just a graphic that shows some cool stuff. All right, so on the transmitter, this inverse DFT or inverse fast Fourier transform gives us the equivalent of racks and racks and racks full of individual quam modulators. Whoops, I keep going too I keep pushing this button here. I need to stay away from that. So there's the quam modulator for the first subcarrier. And just to, just to save space, we'll say that each one of these is one rack unit high. So you've got, say, 4,096 of these things stacked up in the racks in the head end of the hub site. So this IDFT stuff gives us the equivalent of this, and they're all summed together just like a head-end <coughs> combiner um, in the racks. But it's all done in a chip, not in racks and racks and racks of quam modulators inside the head-end. And on the other end, um, the DFT or IFFT gives us the functional equivalent of 4,096. Oh, I know what I'm doing. I think I'm pushing that button. Receiver, so of the, uh, the splitter feeding 4,096 demodulators. It's the equivalent of that, but it's all done on a chip. So that's, the, uh, that's, the, that's all I'm going to talk about, FFT part. See, that's, that's not so bad. There are a couple important points here. We have to get the transmitter's IFFT and the receiver's FFT to line up. They have to be, no, I didn't push anything that time. Um, to line up, so we've got to synchronize the receiver and transmitter. Um, and that involves timing. So in order to adjust the symbol timing so that the FFT process starts at the right time, we transmit something called a cyclic prefix. That's a, uh, think of it as kind of a photocopy of the tail end of a symbol. Just take a little copy of that and glue it onto the beginning of the symbol. That makes, of course, makes the overall symbol length greater. But um, the, that gives us the ability for the FFT to, uh, to synchronize and, and lock up. The other thing, of course, it does, it gives us uh, the ability to compensate for echoes. So we can change the, the width of this cyclic prefix or just you know, how, much, how long it is in time um, to compensate for different micro-reflection conditions in our plant. So this, the uh, cyclic prefix does a couple things. It gives us uh, the ability to combat micro-reflections, but it also helps us to uh, adjust symbol timing so that the FFT process works. The other thing we have to do, uh, remember I said how critical frequency is? How do we synchronize the cable modem to the uh, CMTS's signal and vice versa? How do we synchronize the cable modem's upstream transmit signal um, to the receiver in the, uh, in the CMTS? Well, in the downstream, 
we do this using something called continuous pilots. These are subcarriers that are dedicated for this synchronization process. They do not carry data, and they are used to measure frequency offset. For equalization, to compensate for uh, amplitude and phase problems, part of the adaptive equalization process, we use something called scattered pilots in the downstream. These also do not carry data. Um, now, the, the continuous pilots get the, the name continuous from the fact that they stay in the same place all the time. They're in the same subcarrier frequency inside that OFDM channel all the time. Remember those little spikes sticking up out of the OFDM haystack? Those are the continuous pilots. The scattered pilots actually move around, so they, did, they didn't show up in that, that screenshot. So they're, they're moving around all the time, so that they, over time, visit every subcarrier frequency position over a period of time. And then those things, um, as I mentioned, don't carry data, um, and they're used to help measure channel response so that the adaptive equalization process can, can actually work. Sorry, Mark. I'll come up here and block your, your view for a while if that's okay. Yeah. So we've got all these things then to help us with this timing and the, the phase alignment and the frequency alignment, the pilots and the, um, the cyclic prefixes or, that, we, that we add on to things. There we go. All right, now let's take a look at a graphic representation of a 192 megahertz wide OFDM channel. And that's, that's indicated by this, this green rectangular sort of thing here. So the occupied bandwidth, or the channel bandwidth in this case, is 192 megahertz. It includes approximately a 1 megahertz wide taper region on each end of the channel. This 192 megahertz wide OFDM signal depending on the subcarrier spacing that we've chosen, can be either um, 7,600 subcarriers or 3,800 subcarriers. If we're doing 25 kilohertz spacing, obviously we get more subcarriers, so there would be 7,600 of them in here. If we're doing 50 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, we've got 3,800 subcarriers, and respectively those are called 8K FFT and 4K FFT. So you'll hear that term from time to time. In compass spectrum, if we take out those taper regions, which some people like to call guard bands, but if we take those out, um, what's left over is the, we'll call it this active spectrum here. Um, that's called the encompass spectrum. So in the, uh, the downstream, the maximum is 190 megahertz, minimum is 22 megahertz. Now to, uh, to kind of compare this to DOCSIS 3.0 and earlier single carrier QAM, you, you're probably familiar with the term alpha. Or, or the roll-off in, in uh, single-carrier QAM. Um, in this case, we can kind of come up with a rough analogy uh, between OFDM and single-carrier QAM. In this case, we've got a 1 megahertz wide guard band or taper region on each end of the channel. So we'll say 2 megahertz out of 192 megahertz is our excess bandwidth. So we'll just say 2 divided by 192 times 100 gives us approximately 1% alpha, compared to about 12% for for DOCSIS 3.0 and earlier 256 QAM. So right away you can see already there's some improvement in, in spectral efficiency because our uh, equivalent excess bandwidth is smaller with OFDM. Now, I do need to point out that we've got the other overhead I talked about, the, the uh, continuous pilots and the scattered pilots, um, cyclic prefix and, and next code word pointer, pointer and so on. So those do... Um, use up some of the overhead that's available in there, so you know, we're not going to get 100% use of, of all the potential capacity of our channel. Uh, so some of it will be taken out. But even with all that, the spectral efficiency is still better than single carrier QAM. There we go. So here's a closer look at the taper regions on the end. So you can see I got the little, the little gray spikes here where, where there would be subcarriers but they're excluded. What that means is they're turned off. So we have this roughly one megahertz wide taper region. And, and actually, um, if you look at this on a piece of test equipment, this actually kind of, the, uh, the taper region includes this kind of roll off region here. So it's not this nice sharp drop like I show here, but I'm just showing the approximate width of the, of the taper region. That's the minimum. The DOCSIS 3.1 spec says the minimum taper region on each end of the downstream channel has to be at least one megahertz. And it can be, it can be more. Uh, depending on how you configure the roll-off factor 
in, uh, in the CMTS, and it'll, it'll change that. DOCSIS 3.1 is pretty powerful, and it gives us a lot of knobs to adjust. So does that mean the CMTS comes with all these knobs on the front panel? No, it, no, no, it's all done in software. But there are so many things that can be changed and tweaked and configured and adjusted. Uh, there's a bit of a learning curve that the cable industry is going to have to go through to figure out how to optimize DOCSIS 3.1. And you might ask, well, why'd they make it so complicated and include all these knobs to tweak? Well, the answer is there is so much flexibility built into the spec and the technology that DOCSIS 3.1 can be optimized for just about any network condition. That's the power of this, is to be able to provide the robustness and the efficiency for just about any condition network. I mean, you can certainly break DOCSIS 3.1 if the network's in really bad shape, but there are so, so many things that can be tweaked and optimized um, that you can really almost customize the OFDM and the OFDMA for your specific network or for parts of your specific network. Let's consider a hypothetical example in which LTE interference is getting into the network through some loose connectors. Now, in reality, there aren't any out there, right? This, this is purely a hypothetical thing that we might test in the lab just to see what happens. It, no real loose connectors in the network. But let's assume that that loose connector creates some ingress from a nearby LTE transmitter. There are a couple ways we can deal with that. One, of course, is to create something called an exclusion band. An exclusion band is a part of the OFDM channel in which we have turned off or excluded a certain number of subcarriers. So in this particular case, we've excluded the subcarriers that are in the vicinity of the interfering signal. So we just turn them off, and there's our ingress, which is not affecting the performance of the rest of the channel. In the world of single carrier QAM, if you have ingress in the channel, it, if it's high enough in, in amplitude, will wipe out the channel. The entire channel is no good. With, with OFDM and the ability to create, say, an exclusion band, you could have an ingress affecting part of the channel. You just turn off those subcarriers. The rest of the channel is unaffected. Maybe there's no interference. Maybe your marketing department, can anybody here from marketing? <laughs> They're all gone? So maybe the marketing department came to you and said, look, you've got to leave the legacy channels on these frequencies. You cannot move them. You say, well, OK. How do we deal with that in the world of DOCSIS 3.1? Create an exclusion band where those legacy single carrier QAM channels are. You still have the full channel here with a little chunk of it turned off and being used for your legacy channels. <coughs> So there's another application that can be used. Yet another powerful feature in DOCSIS 3.1 is the ability to use something called bit loading. Now let's go back to our example, again, hypothetical, of ingress getting in through a loose connector in the network someplace. And we understand that the ingress is not quite strong enough to to uh, require us to, to create an exclusion band, but it's still there, uh, and we find that, well, we, if we change the modulation order in that part of the spectrum to a lower modulation order, let's say instead of 4K QAM, maybe we drop down to 256 QAM, then things will continue to work. So what that means is the lighter green portion here would represent the subcarriers that have a lower modulation order um, that is more robust in the presence of this particular interference. The rest of the channel, the darker green, is operating at 4K QAM, for instance. So we've not given up um, the usability of that part of the spectrum by creating an exclusion band. Instead, in this case, we've just reduced the modulation order on that group of subcarriers. Now, there's one other thing I want to mention that I have not included in the slide. And this is something that, that not a lot of people may be aware of. But remember, near the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that part of the forward error correction includes time domain interleaving, and frequency domain interleaving. So let's take a hypothetical situation where we've got a 192 megahertz wide OFDM signal, and we're transmitting 4K QAM, 4096 QAM. But let's also assume that we've got that nasty loose connector again, allowing some ingress into the plant. 
What's that going to do to the 4K QAM signal? What do you think? Well, the answer is it depends. But the it depends part is the fun part of DOCSIS 3.1 because of frequency interleaving in conjunction with, with uh, LDPC. I've got a graph later on that shows the MER thresholds for the different modulation orders supported in DOCSIS 3.1. The MER threshold for 4K QAM is a little over 35 dB, about 35.2, 35.3 dB. And what that means is that when the MER per subcarrier reaches that value, we've kind of reached the crash point for 4K QAM. Um, and if the MER drops below that, then 4K QAM stops working. <coughs> But there's an exception to that. If only a small part of the OFDM channel has the subcarrier MER degraded because of some interference, you know, wideband noise or LTE like this, because of frequency domain interleaving, when those subcarriers are de interleaved in the receiver, they're spread across typically multiple code words per symbol, and the LDPC can fix them, even if the MER per subcarrier in that interference part of the channel is below the threshold for the modulation order. I'll give you an example. And we've, we've done some of this testing playing around in the lab where we injected the equivalent of 30 megahertz of noise, but we just did it with, with uh, uh, five uh, single carrier QAM channels and just combine them with a splitter or something underneath the OFDM haystack and then use an attenuator to to adjust the amplitude of the interfering signal. So it's like a 30 megahertz wide chunk of noise. Um, and as the noise amplitude increases, then of course the per subcarrier MER at that <coughs> frequency point, that is that 30 megahertz wide, we'll call it interference region, as the, as the MER per MER subcarrier drops, you'll eventually reach a point where 4K QAM will stop working. And the assumption here is that all the subcarriers across the channel are 4K QAM, with the exception of the ones that have other, other modulation orders because of whatever reasons. I'll talk about some of that later. If the channel is 96 megahertz wide and you inject a 36 or a 30 megahertz wide block of noise underneath the channel, not under the PLC, you can't put it there, but under the, under the channel, the per subcarrier MER in the interference region can drop down to a roughly 30 dB. Now that's about 5 dB below the MER failure threshold for 4K QAM. Yet 4K QAM continues to work with no uncorrectable code word errors. And then you drop another half dB and things go out the window real quick. And here's something even more interesting. You try the same thing with a 192 megahertz wide OFDM channel, that is a 30, and a 30 megahertz wide block of noise interfering with it. The per subcarrier MER can drop to just above 20 dB, and 4K QAM keeps working. Now, in this case, the 30 megahertz wide chunk of interference is a smaller percentage of the total OFDM channel with a 192 megahertz wide channel than it was with a 96 megahertz wide channel. And that means then that the de interleaved subcarriers, remember they're interleaved in the frequency domain, they get spread across even more code words, and LDPC is able to fix them. So you could, you could have a scenario where per subcarrier MER is, say, 25 dB here, and you say, well, that's 10 dB below the failure threshold for 4K QAM, and it'll still work. How cool is that? That's part of the power of having the frequency domain interleave, interleaving as part of the forward error correction. And you combine it with the LDPC, and it becomes really robust. Now, if, if to, to just show that, you know, how the textbooks prove that the MER threshold for 4K QAM really is a little over 35 dB, if you inject wideband noise under the full 192 megahertz and slowly increase it until the per subcarrier MER drops to 35 dB everywhere, at that point, 4K QAM stops working because you can't de-interleave and spread that noise anywhere because they're all affected. But as long as the interference affects a, a fairly small percentage of the total channel, you can get away with a lot worse impairments than you might have thought possible. And once again, we've got the power of this OFDM technology and, and the forward error correction that comes along with it. All right, I want to talk a little bit about 
the, uh, the PLC. This is an important, important part of our OFDM signal. The PLC, or phi link channel, or physical layer link channel, is represented in this graphic by the red vertical line. It's only 400 kilohertz wide. The phi link channel is used to transmit or convey the physical layer parameters from the CMTS to the cable modem. It tells the cable modem, okay, here's the modulation order on all the different subcarriers. This is how wide the channel is. Um, and, and all the other stuff, where the upstream transmit frequency is, tells, all, tells the modem all this stuff in the PLC. So the, the cable modem is looking for the PLC, and it wants to find out where that is so it can get all the physical layer stuff and use that to come online. You notice that I, I show it sitting in the center of this little yellow rectangle here. This, this is called the, uh, um, the PLC region. It, it may have other names, um, but this yellow is a six megahertz wide chunk of subcarriers that carry data. It's just that you're not allowed to create exclusion bands in here. And the PLC has to be centered right in the middle of it. Okay, button, come on. There we go. You get to choose where to put it. The PLC. The reason for that is you know where strong over-the-air signals are that could potentially leak into the network through that hypothetical make-believe would never happen in real life loose connector where ingress might get in and cause interference or maybe there's some known interfering signal in the cable network. Stay away from those places. Put the PLC in a part of the spectrum that is not going to get interference if ingress should occur um, and is not going to be affected by any say, any say any distortions that might be carried in the network. So. You pick the frequency where the PLC goes. There's what it looks like expanded out. If it's 50 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, eight subcarriers make up the PLC. If you're using 25 kilohertz spacing, then there are 16 subcarriers in here. And you'll notice, as before, the PLC's right smack dab in the middle of this six megahertz wide region. The modulation used in the PLC is 16 quam. If your downstream won't support 16 QAM, you have other problems besides <laughs> trying to make OFDM work. This is a pretty robust signal, because I've had people ask, well, wait a minute, why didn't the, the Phi working group come up with redundant PLCs and have two PLCs? Well, come on, how much overhead do you want to give away? This is pretty robust. You pick the frequency where it's not going to receive any known interference, and then the forward error correction and the really low and pretty robust modulation order will help to ensure the, uh, the reliability of this signal. Now let's take a look at these things called pilots. Earlier I mentioned the need for this precise frequency tracking, and then of course you know, there's the phase tracking and so on. But for the frequency tracking, then the, the continuous pilots provide that. These are the ones that sit in the same place all the time. They never change frequency. They're always in the same frequency slots throughout that OFDM channel. And there can be anywhere from 16 to 128 of these in one channel. And there are also eight of them in the PLC band. And I'll expand on this a little bit on the next slide, because this is pretty important, because there's a specific pattern to how these pilots in the PLC band are spaced out. That's how the cable modem knows where they are and is able to find them. These do not carry data. That is. All the continuous pilots do not carry data, although they are BPSK modulated with a pseudo-random sequence, but they don't, they don't carry user data. The other thing is they're boosted 6 dB. And you might look at that and say, wait a minute, what's this going to do to laser clipping and stuff? The answer is nothing. And I'll explain why later on. But trust me. Here's an expanded view of, the, of the, uh, the PLC band. There's the PLC in the middle of it. And you can see the continuous pilot spacing around the PLC. And remember, all the rest of these subcarriers are regular data subcarriers. They, they carry the usual data from the CMTS to the modem, just like all the other subcarriers do, or most of the other subcarriers do in the rest of the channel. But we've got these continuous pilots in this very symmetrical and very carefully defined pattern around the PLC, which you cannot change. This is defined in the spec. 
This is what the modem looks for to figure out where the PLC is, and then it can receive and demodulate the PLC and, and, uh, and go forward from there. There's an example of scattered pilots. In this case, I show them in light blue mixed in with the continuous pilots. So the continuous pilots are the dark green ones, and the scattered pilots are the, the, uh, the lighter blue ones right here. These things occur every 128 subcarriers, but not inside the PL band, PLC band or an exclusion band. And they're used, as, used to estimate channel frequency response as part of the adaptive equalization process. Like the continuous pilots, they do not carry data, and they are also BPSK modulated. And they're also boosted by 6 dB. And here, too, you might say, wait a minute, you've got continuous pilots and scattered pilots boosted 6 dB above the data subcarriers. Isn't this going to cause problems? No. No. reason is that the impact on the total power of the channel with all those, sub, all those pilots present, less than a dB. So it's not a problem. And we'll just skip past this little part right here. Okay. This question comes up from time to time. What kind of traffic can we carry in an OFDM channel? And it's pretty much any kind of traffic you want. Broadcast, multicast, unicast. Do all modems, multiple modems, or a single modem? Take your pick. It does it all. Now we'll take a quick look at the upstream. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. With 25 kilohertz spacing, and remember we have a, uh, it's a 96 megahertz channel. The encompass spectrum is 95 megahertz, so there'd be a half, half a megahertz taper region or guard band on each end. If we're using 25 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, there are 3,800 subcarriers in the channel. If we're using 50 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, it's 1,900 subcarriers, and we call those 4K and 2K FFT, respectively. Same technology is used to maintain orthogonality and and so forth in the, uh, in the channel. There's an expanded view of the ends of the channel where you can see, in this case, 500 kilohertz wide taper region. Uh, the reality is it's not going to be this nice sharp drop off. It's going to actually be kind of this little, like side bands here, if you will, coming off the subcarriers. But this just gives a kind of a graphic example of, of the taper region on the ends of the channel. Like the downstream, we can create an exclusion band to deal with ingress. Got ingress? The return path ingress, I, I think, is job security. No, it <laughs> yeah, you laugh, but how, how many of you have gone out troubleshooting ingress in the field? Okay, most of you haven't, it looks like. But I'm sure you have people who work for you who have gone out to troubleshoot ingress in the return path. Um, it's there, and it can be a problem. You know, CB radio, shortwave, uh, any, any uh, ham radio operators in the group? Amateur radio? Come on, don't be bashful. <laughs> I know you are, Roger. I am. Got a couple up here, a couple more up there. Okay, see, now you're getting brave, raising your hands. Yes? What? It's a fun hobby. Talk to the world and into space. Talk to, the, talk to the astronauts on the space station, if you like. Anyway, our, our HF signals can get into the return path through loose connectors and other things. I, I don't remember what the, the uh, British government limit is on maximum transmit power in the UK. 400 watts? In the US, it's 1,500 watts. <laughs> Legal, um, which means if I transmit with 1,500 watts and the cable company's F connector at the next door neighbor's house is loose, please don't come over and knock down my tower and antennas because I'm interfering with the upstream spectrum in the cable network. The cable company is responsible for tightening up those loose F connectors and otherwise getting the ingress um, under control. But that said, sometimes it's difficult to troubleshoot and fix the ingress problem. So here too, if we have ingress, we can create an exclusion band in the OFDMA signal and not transmit any subcarriers on those frequencies where the ingress is. Or if that doggone marketing department again says, you got to put your upstream DOCSIS 3.0 signals on these frequencies and you're not allowed to change them. <laughs> Okay, fine. Create an exclusion band in the OFDMA channel, and there's where your legacy single carrier QAM signals in the return path go. Remember I mentioned the uh, two-dimensional usage of the return path with OFDMA? Here's a graphic that illustrates a full 
bandwidth upstream OFDMA channel. And for this, I kept it simple and said we've got five different cable modems transmitting simultaneously. In this case, each cable modem is assigned its own group of subcarriers. And you look at that and say, well, that's kind of cool. But then you stop to think about it and say, oh, wait a minute. The signals, that is the groups of subcarriers from each of these five cable modems is coming from different parts of the network simultaneously. And in order to maintain orthogonality, because there are no guard bands between these, those subcarriers have to overlap, and all the subcarriers have to be orthogonal, even the ones coming from different cable modems. And by the time they're received at the CMTS, they should ideally be all the same amplitude. So the CMTS and cable modem have got a lot of interaction going on to help maintain timing and phase relationships so all these subcarriers overlap just right, and we have the frequency and phase tightness required to maintain orthogonality without causing any interference, and the proper power level. So you can see all, all of a sudden that, oh, this DOCSIS 3.1 thing is pretty doggone complicated. And in fact, it is. But here, too, all this interaction is going on behind the scenes. We don't have to worry about that as cable operators. We plug this in, and it's supposed to work. And that's, that's uh, that it's, you know, we don't have to get in there and, okay, I've got to adjust the spacing knob here for cable modem number one and the, the frequency knob for cable modem number two and the amplitude knob for cable modem number two. No, we don't do that. That's all done behind the scenes electronically. And we can expand this just a little bit in, uh, and look at the concept of mini slots. Uh, for those of you who have dealt with DOCSIS 3.0 and earlier, you know that the mini slots are a way of dividing up the, uh, the time into little chunks. And each cable modem, remember my example over here, picking on the people in the audience, each person is assigned a certain number of mini slots in which to transmit data. Those are little time slots. Well, in DOCSIS 3.1, we have mini slots that take advantage of the time domain and the frequency domain. So in this case, I'm showing just the frequency domain part of this. So here, I'm just taking a 6.4 megahertz chunk of an OFDMA channel and expanding it out up here. And, and here, the mini slots, depending on subcarrier spacing, are either eight megahertz or either eight subcarriers or 16 subcarriers. And of course, a cable modem can transmit a single mini slot or multiple mini slots at the same time. Um, in order to kind of differentiate different groups of mini slots being transmitted by different cable modems, I've got them shown in different colors here. But let's say transmitter number one is this group right here. The first mini slot is always called an edge mini slot, and the rest are called body mini slots. So this particular cable modem is, is transmitting five mini slots in its burst. This is in the frequency domain, remember. These are groups of subcarriers. So it's got five groups of these mini slots, the edge one and then four bodies. The next cable modem's got four, so the first one's an edge mini slot and three body mini slots. And then transmission number three, well, that's just a quick one. That's just, that's just one mini slot, so it's an edge mini slot. There's no body mini slot with that. And the next cable modem's burst starts with an edge mini slot, followed by, in this case, five, five body mini slots. And there's also some stuff going on in the time domain, too, that I don't, I don't show in, the, in this particular presentation. Um, and this just gives us a um, more efficient way to use the upstream, because we're using the upstream in the frequency domain, as shown here, and in the time domain, which really improves the ability to utilize the, the upstream spectrum in our networks. And here's uh, pilots. Yeah, we got these pilots in the upstream too. Except in this case, they're not called continuous pilots, they're just pilots. Like the downstream continuous pilots, the upstream pilots, remember no continuous here, just pilots, do not carry data. They're also um, BPSK modulated, used to adapt to channel conditions and, and frequency offset, kind of like the downstream. There are um, different pilot patterns supported in the spec. And what that means is it changes the number, the number and placement of, of pilots within the channel, depending on how nasty the upstream is. So if, if you get more aggressive with the pilot pattern, of course, that reduces throughput because you're putting more pilots in there that, that take up more of the, uh, the subcarriers. But it helps you at least get data through, and otherwise you might not be able to. So there's some more, uh, some more robustness there. Also, uh, like the downstream, the upstream 
pilots are boosted, in this case 4.7 dB instead of 6. There are also complementary pilots, which would be kind of like scattered pilots. Question? Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, I've, okay, I've watched the, the clock here. So the complementary pilots are used in the upstream only. They're not used in the downstream. These do carry data, but at a lower modulation order. So for example, if your regular data pilots are 256 qualm, then the complementary pilots will be 16 qualm. And these would, uh, they're also boosted, and like the regular pilots in the upstream, there are different patterns available to account for different uh, impairment conditions in the return path. And these typically are used for uh, enhancement in the signal processing and helping with the center frequency um, offset acquisition. So that's the, uh, the pilot piece in the upstream. And let's pause right here. I think this is a good place to, to break for tea. And then uh, when we come back from tea, I'll continue with the presentation. And certainly open for questions during the break, or if you want to wait till the end, you can. Welcome back from the break. It looks like most everyone came back, so that's, I think that's doing okay, despite the fact they have to go out and battle the, the fewest. Well, there's the traffic and the, uh, the underground, and I understand. So where we left off now was with this slide. Of course, everybody wants to know, what are the modulation orders supported in, in DOCSIS 3.1? And I, I mentioned some of them in, at the beginning of the presentation, but this summarizes what's supported in the downstream. Um, 16 QAM through 16,384 QAM. Everything below the red line is, um, is a modulation order that's, that's higher than what is supported in DOCSIS 3.0 today. So these are all the modulation orders supported in the downstream, and you can see the must requirements from the 3.15 spec, the may requirements for the CMTS and, and the cable modem number of bits per symbol. And here are the upstream modulation orders, and you can see that it goes from QPSK um, through 4096 QAM, that's the must on the modem, and the CMTS receive is QPSK through 1024 QAM with a should on 2048 and 4096. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the Cable Labs must, should, and may, must, of course, means that it has to be done. Should means you better have a really good reason for not doing it if you don't. <laughs> and may is, okay, it's optional, you don't have to do it. But that's, that, that's the, they don't put that in the definitions in the spec, but if you go to Cable Labs, that, that's kind of the answer that comes out is, yeah, yeah must is, got to do it. Should is, yeah, you pretty much got to do it, and if you don't, you better have a really, really good reason. So these are the modulation orders in the upstream and the bits per symbol. LDPC I'll just touch on briefly because this is, this is a pretty um, complicated type of forward error correction. As mentioned earlier, LDPC is an abbreviation for low density parity check. The concept was created by a person named Robert Gallagher in his 1960 SCD thesis. And it was published by MIT as a technical monograph in, I think, 1963. Interesting thing is, it is such a complicated form of error correction that the computational technology simply didn't exist when Gallagher invented this idea. And it's just been in recent years that the computational um, capability in has, has finally migrated to chipsets. So it's, in the, it's built into the chips and cable modems and CMTSs, but that's how complicated this was. He's still alive uh, in his 80s now, and he, I'm sure he's tickled uh, that, that his concept of error correction is now being used in, well, not only DOCSIS 3.1, but, but other transmission technologies as well, because it is extremely um, powerful. Uh, the the uh, downstream also includes as an outer code something called BCH, which is named after the people who invented it, and it's just, it's kind of a Think of it as a mop-up or a clean-up uh, that just helps to clean up some of the residual errors left over after, after LDPC. Here's where the improvements come into play. Uh, if you take a look at this, there's the line beyond which we cannot go, the Shannon line. That's as good as it gets. The, uh, the little colored marks here are the, uh, the spectral efficiency limits versus signal-to-noise ratio for uh, different modulation orders. Um, and here you can see the DOCSIS 3.0 triangle right here. 
And then these are, these are all the, the ones, and in, in, in case I misstated that, all of these are for DOCSIS 3.1. Um, there's DOCSIS 3.0. And if you take a look then and compare DOCSIS 3.0 single carrier QAM with the uh, Reed Solomon forward error correction and compare that to 256 QAM using LDPC, you can see there's about a 3 dB coding gain. That's pretty impressive by itself. Now, some people might think, well, 3 dB, that doesn't sound like much. But in the world of coding gain with forward error correction, 3 dB is a lot. And that gets us, you can see how much closer to the Shannon limit we are here. The other thing is on spectral efficiency. Remember I said the spectral efficiency is better with DOCSIS 3.1? It's up to one and a half times better. So take a look at this, going this direction. So there are the improvements that we can get with DOCSIS 3.1. Um, and the forward error correction that's supported in there. So if we, if we think about what does this mean in the real world, um, it gives us approximately a 3 dB signal-to-noise ratio improvement over DOCSIS 3.0 using 256 QAM. In other words, you could have 3 dB lower signal-to-noise ratio when you're using LDPC than, uh, than with Reed Solomon with single-carrier QAM and have the same performance. So that's, that's what that means. There are the, uh, the MER thresholds for the various modulation orders supported by DOCSIS 3.1. And if you take a look, um, this last one right here is 4096 QAM. And you can see that the MER threshold um, versus the bit error ratio is you know, roughly 35 dB, give or take a little bit right there. That's, that's where it starts to fall apart. And of course, if you have a, an OFDM channel full of 4,096 QAM, and you have, say, an additive white Gaussian noise uh, interference. You'll cross the full channel, and you crank that noise higher and higher in amplitude till the per subcarrier MER hits about 35 dB. That's the crash point. But as I mentioned, because of the of the frequency domain interleaving, if you had a narrower bandwidth of uh, of interference, because of the frequency domain interleaving in conjunction with the LDPC. Um, you could ha actually have per subcarrier MER in the interference region that is below, say, the threshold here, and it'll still work because the LDPC is able to fix at least those subcarriers because they're spread across multiple code words on, after deinterleaving. All right, downstream frequency usage. Remember, I said that the mandatory frequency usage that must be supported is 258 megahertz to roughly 1.2 gigahertz. So this is. This is what the DOCSIS equipment has to do. That's the modems and the CMTS. Must do that. Optionally, they can support this. That would be expanding the, uh, the lower end of the downstream spectrum to 108 megahertz and, and optionally expanding the upper end to 1,794 megahertz or roughly 1.8 gigahertz. The equipment also, in order to be DOCSIS compliant, must support a minimum of two 192 megahertz wide OFDM channels in the downstream. You can do more than that if you want, but... But that's the minimum, so the, the DOCSIS equipment must support that. I was going to get ready to do a little dance here. <laughs> the... In the upstream, remember I said that 5 to 85 megahertz is the mandatory. That's this green part right here. 204 megahertz is the upper end, and then all these intermediate bandwidths are supported as well. So 5 megahertz to 42 megahertz, 5 megahertz to 65 megahertz, 5 megahertz to 85 megahertz, 5 megahertz to 117 megahertz, and 5 megahertz to 204 megahertz. So pretty flexible in terms of how you can deploy DOCSIS 3.1 technology in, in your systems. The um, equipment must support a minim minimum of two full OFDMA channels, that is 95 megahertz encompass spectrum or 96 megahertz channel bandwidth. Now, obviously, you're not going to get a 95 or 96 megahertz wide OFDM A channel to fit in a 5 megahertz to 42 megahertz return or a 5 megahertz to 65 megahertz return. You'd, in order to take advantage of that, you'd have to expand the, the bandwidth in the return path to, to do so. But it, the, uh, the support for that is built in. So what's an example of some upstream frequency usage? Uh, remember earlier I said that we can do kind of a... Uh, two-dimensional usage of the return path. So I'll show you an example here. Let's, we'll just assume the downstream is doing whatever the downstream does, perhaps with a mix of single carrier QAM and, and uh, an OFDM, maybe an analog channel or two in there. So the upstream, maybe from 5 to 42 megahertz, might support today 
say you're, perhaps you're transmitting two bonded um, single carrier qualm channels in a return path. So you divide the return path usage up on a time basis, getting close to demonstrating how to conduct or construct an oscillator here. Um, as you look at this then, so during another time slot, the 3.1 modems transmit OFDMA. So we, this, is, this should be going faster than this. So you can see that you alternate, so different time slots, the 3.0 modems transmit their signal. Another time slot, the OFDMA can take up you know, whatever, whatever bandwidth you've assigned it to in the return path. So you can kind of go back and forth like that. So that's one way to share the upstream spectrum. Another way is to do this. Create an exclusion band, and you put the legacy 3.0 signals here, and the OFDMA occupies the rest of the return path. And you can get even more creative. I don't show it on the slide here. Maybe when the, the scheduler says, okay, we don't need this legacy channel for a given transmission, so we'll fill that chunk of the spectrum in with OFDMA. So there's a lot of additional flexibility built into the way that the scheduler and the CMTS could tell the modems in the field to transmit. And it really provides a lot of flexibility in how your network can take advantage of DOCSIS 3.1 transmission. Um, the other thing that it's, that's important to understand is in addition to the channel bonding supported in DOCSIS 3.0, channel bonding is all supported between 3.0 and 3.1. So what that means is your legacy 3.0 downstream single carrier QAM channels and your OFDMA channel for 3.1 can be bonded so that the 3.1 modems get more data in the downstream. Now obviously the 3.0 modems can't receive the data from the OFDM channel, um, but you're, you're able to increase the total throughput to the 3.1 modems. Likewise, in the upstream, you can bond the single carrier QAM and the OFDMA so that the 3.1 modems are able to get more data going through um, the return path, while the 3.0 modems will operate the way they always have. So here's, again, more flexibility, more knobs to tweak uh, in the operation of your DOCSIS network with 3.1. Now let's talk a little bit about plant performance because this is a question that everybody has. And that is, what's it going to take in my network to allow 3.1 to work reliably? Now some of you may have seen this graph. This was put together by Dave Urban from Comcast and it's been ripped off and used in all kinds of presentations including this one. Uh, but what, what Comcast did was, was poll something like 20 million cable modems in their network and plot um, number of modems versus downstream MER. Um, you know, some people call it SNR, but it's technically MER, and plotted this graph. And so you can see uh, vertical axis is uh, millions of cable modems, horizontal axis is the MER. And the importance of this graph will be, um, will be shown here in just a second. But here are some recommended minimum MER values for the various modulation orders in DOCSIS 3.1. 4K QAM, kind of 40 to 42 dB. Remember the failure threshold is about 35. 2048 or 2K QAM, 37 to 39 dB. 1024 QAM, 34 to 36. 512 QAM, 31 to 33. 256 QAM, 29 to 30. Will it operate at MER values lower than this? Yeah, it will. There's a Roughly 6 dB of MER headroom built into these numbers um, to account for channel effects and implementation loss. But in reality, you could operate with somewhat lower margins than that. Whether you should is a decision you'll have to make. These are recommendations that can be found in the DOCSIS 3.1 FI spec, and they're, they're, I think they're good general guidelines as a starting point. Now, how does this play a role in this thing I called multiple modulation profiles at the, uh, the introduction of, the, of the, uh, the presentation. This is pretty neat. If you, if you were to plot the graph of downstream MER versus the number of modems in your network, it, it probably would look something like this. So this, this tells you then that you could set up, say, four modulation profiles to account for different MER conditions experienced by different customers in your network. So some percentage of your customers might have 
input MER to the cable modems in the yeah, roughly 31 to 33 dB range. So they get 256 qualm. Average case, pretty large number, kind of centered around 35 dB plus or minus a little bit. They get 1024 qualm. That basically means 256 qualm works today. You flip the switch to, to 1024 qualm with, with OFDM, it works fine. Probably would work down here too, but that's probably pushing it. Better case, <laughs> 37 to 39 dB. These subscribers get 2K qualm. And then the best case would be up here in the kind of the roughly 40 to 42 dB range. They get 4K qualm. You may find that uh, depending on the condition of your network, uh, your actual mileage may vary, as the saying goes. Uh, and of course, and the reality is your, your network could be better than this. It, it might not be quite as good as this. But this gives you an example of, of how the multiple modulation profiles are used. So this is going on simultaneously. So nobody gets left out. The, the customers in parts of the network that may need some remediation work or something can still take advantage of the increased throughput of DOCSIS 3.1. They do so with a lower modulation order. They don't get the throughput that a customer in a, in a better part of the network gets, but everybody gets something. So there's no lowest common denominator going on with DOCSIS 3.1. I think that's a pretty impressive part of the, uh, of the spec. Ooh, I don't know what happened to the layout on that one. Because that... I know in the original slide it does not look like that. This one shows um, data rates in the downstream. And for some reason that table just blew up all over the place. Um, bottom line is on this thing, though, depending on subcarrier spacing, this goes all the way up to... I think I went all the way up to 16,384 qualm at the bottom of the table. And it's, uh, it's, about, it's a little over 2 gigabits per second in a single 192 megahertz wide channel. And in this case, the, the condition is that there are no exclusion bands, single 192 megahertz channel. And then you can take this, the, day, the, uh, the approximate throughputs in this table and extrapolate to other channel bandwidths if you want. So for example, if you're planning on, to do, planning on doing 96 megahertz wide channels, then you would divide these by two. Um, to get the, the uh, approximate throughput. So that, that's, uh, that's a very strange thing that, that that's doing. And it did the same thing, of course, for the upstream. That figures. Um, so I'll apologize for that. I'm not quite sure why that thing did that, because it's, like it's not like that on the original slide. But same example here, um, 95 megahertz encompass spectrum, but 64 qualm, and I think I went all the way up to 4K qualm uh, with 25 and 50 kilohertz subcarrier spacing. What you'll find is the... Uh, um, 25 kilohertz subcarrier spacing will give you slightly greater throughput, um, but the 50 kilohertz subcarrier spacing is a bit more robust in the presence of impulse noise. So that's, that's the, the difference in why you might pick one versus the other. OK, OFDM deployment questions. And the, this will hopefully answer some of the questions that you might be thinking about as you've been watching um, this presentation today. Do you need to do anything special to prepare your network for DOCSIS 3.1 deployment? The answer is, in most cases, no. If you have available RF spectrum to insert the OFDM channel, that's a big if, but we'll assume you've got a chunk of spectrum where you can put an OFDM channel or part of one. If you've got that, you can deploy a 3.1 today. Now, you might have to tweak the modulation orders on the subcarriers depending on the, the condition of the plant, but you could put it in there today. You don't have to go upgrade the network. You don't have to change diplex filters or do anything. Um, you know, I assume that there are good maintenance practices in place and um, you know, the plant's in reasonably good condition, but you don't have to go out and rebuild or upgrade the plant to do it. Okay, well, should you still do pre-deployment testing? The answer is absolutely yes. Very highly recommended. Um, this is when you, you can inject an OFDM signal from a CMTS that supports it or from dedicated test equipment such as a vector signal generator and go out in the field and make a variety of measurements just to see what happens, and see what, see what the performance is with different modulation orders. Um, and he, you'd want to test you know, not only the modulation profiles, but different cyclic prefix settings to, uh, to see, to see uh, what happens to your per subcarrier MER. Uh, you, know, you may have micro-reflections out there that, that need a little bit more aggressive setting on the cyclic prefix. And roll-off settings to sharpen the band edges on the uh, OFDM channel and so on. So there are a couple options for... Uh, for generating that OFDM signal. What RF power is recommended for the downstream signal? Well, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the OFDM signal should be carried at the same power spectral density as your single carrier QAM channels. And so the, instead of trying to remember that, just remember 
Look on a spectrum analyzer, you see your existing quam channels. Just set the OFDM haystack to the same height. That's it. I know some cable operators have done tests thinking, well, we may have to carry the OFDM channel at a higher power, maybe 3 dB higher. And you know, my answer has been, you probably won't have to do that. Um, you can if you like. And I've participated in field tests where that's been tested. It worked as expected. Um, in that case, the cable operator's optical links were fine, didn't, didn't experience any clipping or anything. Um, but the reality is you don't have to do that. You can, you op generally, you're, you're supposed to operate the OFDM channel at the same power spectral density as your single carrier QAM channels. Same power as what? The pilots. Because pilots are a 6 The pilots are 6 dB higher than, than, your average, than your channel power. Yeah. yeah, don't worry about that. Because the impact of the pilots is less than a dB, even though they're boosted 6. So that's the good news. And, and I know that when cable operators heard about the boosted pilots, there was, oh, good grief, this is going to be an issue. It's going to laser clip. No, it doesn't clip the lasers and stuff. If, you're, if your optical fiber links are reasonably well adjusted um, or properly adjusted, you'll be fine because the impact of the pilots is, is almost negligible. That's the good news. And that's the question right there. The other one, of course, is people will say, well, wait a minute, OFDM has a higher peak to average power ratio than, than, than single carrier quantum. Well, yeah, it does a little bit. And, and during the spec development, the, the Phi working group had some pretty lengthy discussions about this and said, well, do, should we include some mechanism in the spec to reduce the PAPR or the peak to average power ratio? And we determined after some pretty lengthy analysis that if you fill up the spectrum full of single carrier QAM channels or you fill up the spectrum full of OFDM channels, it doesn't matter. The peak to average power ratio for the whole spectrum is about the same. So there was really no need to include PAPR reduction techniques in there. As long as you, you carry your OFDM signal at the same power spectral density as your uh, single carrier QAM, it works fine. So there's really, really not any issue there. Okay, what about test equipment? Is it available? Yeah. How about for routine maintenance and troubleshooting by the techs in the field? The answer is yes. Um, pretty much all the major manufacturers of the handheld instruments that are used in the field by technicians now have DOCSIS 3.1 compatible products or are about to start shipping them. And the reason is they use the same 3.1 cable modem uh, chip sets in their test equipment that the cable modem manufacturers use in the cable modems. And then they tweak their firmware and stuff to pull out things like per subcarry MER and a bunch of other metrics. So the test equipment is available. I've seen it. I've seen it used in the field. I've been out on, on pre-deployment field trials with cable operators, and it works. It works really well. Of course, if you Insist on lab-grade instruments. Rodian Schwartz and Keysight and others will gladly take your money. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative way because they make really good test equipment, and that was all that there was for a while for doing testing. But now the, the, uh, the handheld cable TV test equipment manufacturers have DOCSIS 3.1 compatible test equipment too. Do you need to deploy downstream OFDM and upstream OFDMA at the same time? No. Much like when the DOCSIS 3.0 technology was introduced to the cable industry, most cable operators started bonding downstream channels first, and they didn't do any channel bonding in the upstream, and then later on started doing channel bonding in the return path. Same thing with DOCSIS 3.1. You do not need to deploy OFDMA in the upstream in order for OFDM to work. It works just fine with single carrier QAM in the return path, and then later on you can deploy OFDMA in the return path if you like. Is there any particular part of the spectrum where you have to carry the OFDM signal? The answer is no. You can carry it anywhere you've got uh, available frequency. You can put it in the lower part of the spectrum, the middle, middle part of the spectrum, the upper part of the spectrum. It works surprisingly well. Even in the roll-off region. This has surprised several cable operators who have done tests up near the upper end of the downstream spectrum where the, the response rolls off. OFDM works fine there. So some deployment examples. We'll use the hypothetical situation where you've got a 192 megahertz of... Uh, of open spectrum, so you can put a full 192 megahertz wide OFDM channel in that slot. Uh, notice the heights of the haystacks are all the same here. Um, you use windowing, it's called the, the roll-off factor in the configuration to tweak the sharpness of the spectral edges. So you change the roll-off factor in the time domain and it affects the sharpness of the edges of the channel in the frequency domain. And as I mentioned earlier, you can bond your legacy 3.0 
channels with your OFDM channel to increase the throughput to your 3.1 modems. Need an exclusion band to accommodate some uh, legacy 3.0 carriers or digital video? Fine, create the exclusion band. Uh, if you don't have a full 192 megahertz slot, you build your channel around it by creating a, a, an exclusion band of the appropriate size. Um, Subcarrier nulling does that. And here too, your uh, legacy DOCSIS channels and your OFDM channel can be bonded for the, the 3.1 uh, modems to take advantage of. Um, at least one major cable operator, perhaps others that I'm aware of, are, are doing this because of uh, um, available spectrum limitations. They're, instead of starting with a 192 megahertz channel, they're starting with, say, a 96 megahertz channel. And then some number of DOCSIS 3.0 channels, 24, 32, and then uh, bonding these with these, that gets them the, uh, the bigger pipe, if you will. Um, I know one operator is doing 24 single carrier QAM channels and a 96 megahertz OFDM channel. That gives them a combined or a bonded data rate of roughly 1.6 gigabits per second, because you know there's a rule of thumb that if you're gonna do a gigabit service, ideally you want about the pipe to be about twice the, um, the service package you're going to offer, but you know 1.6 is getting 1.6 gigabits per second is pretty close to uh, to that, and that seems to to be working okay for doing a, a one gigabit per second service. So there's a lot of flexibility in the way that this can be deployed. Over time, maybe you do something like this: um, you mix your legacy and your OFDMA in the return path, and you put a couple OFDM channels in available spectrum in the downstream with your legacy digital video here and then you reserve parts of the spectrum for future OFDM deployments in the, in the return path. Over time, you continue to collapse the, uh, the legacy digital video channels and carry more and more in your DOCSIS 3.1 payload and just keep adding more and more OFDM channels. And eventually, of course, the goal might be this, a full, full spectrum of DOCSIS 3.1 signals, 296 megahertz or 95 megahertz encompass spectrum. Um, channels here in the 5 to 204 megahertz range and 258 up to, you know, eventually perhaps 1.8 gigahertz where you could, this would give you then the, uh, the 10 plus gigabits per second in the downstream and 1 plus gigabits per second in the upstream. Now, obviously to do this, you would have to make upgrades to your network. Um, but certainly to just deploy some limited DOCSIS 3.1 service. You don't have to make any changes to the network if you've got available RF spectrum. Backwards compatibility, that was mandatory when the 3.1 Phi working group got together. The cable operators said, got to have backwards compatibility, keep doing it, just like has always been done with each new version of DOCSIS, so this is no exception. So backwards compatibility um, ensures that you don't have to go in and replace all your equipment um, to just to be able to do, uh, to, to support 3.0 and and 3.1, or even earlier versions of DOCSIS if you carry that. You carry that. Um, PNM, I'll, I'll touch on a little bit here. This, this will take us through the, uh, the end of the presentation. Um, proactive network maintenance is a pretty nifty concept that was introduced by, uh, uh, in a paper presented by Alberto Campos and some of his colleagues at Cable Labs uh, at uh, Cable Tech Expo in 2008. And the idea was um, to use the upstream pre-equalization coefficients as a way to identify the existence of faults in the return path or, or you know, impairments, and then to locate them. And the, uh, the idea resulted in the formation of a working group at Cable Labs called the, uh, the PNM Working Group. I've been a member of that since the beginning. Um, a, a best practices document was published in, I think, 2009 or thereabouts. And version two was published in 20... 10 or 2011, version 3 was just published, and it, it's got all kinds of cool stuff in it. If you want to learn more about adaptive equalization and some of the other things that go on behind the scenes, there are some appendices in the, this best practices document, that, and there's no cost for it. You can download it from Cable Lab's website. You'll see my fingerprints all over the, some of these tutorial pieces on adaptive equalization and stuff. Uh, and it, but it explains how all this stuff works and how you can create a, a software tool to... Um, pull this pre-equalization information from the cable modems and, and convert it to, to uh, in-channel frequency response and in-channel group delay and, and other performance metrics. And you can overlay the information on maps of your network and figure out where these problems are. Uh, full band capture um, and some other 
Other things were added in the uh, third version of the best practices document. But all of the proactive network maintenance to date has been kind of an afterthought to DOCSIS. The earlier versions of DOCSIS, DOCSIS did not say anything about PNM. But when the, um, the idea of creating a new spec to be called 3.1 came about, those of us on the PNM working group said, wait a minute, if we're going to have a new DOCSIS spec, let's include some hooks for PNM. So there's a full section, section 9, of the physical layer spec for DOCSIS 3.1 that is devoted entirely to proactive network maintenance. And there is some powerful, powerful stuff in there. This is the block diagram of the functionality in the 3.1 PNM. The device under test here is your cable network. All the functionality or equivalent functionality supported in PNM uh, includes network analyzer-like functions, spectrum analyzer functions, vector signal analyzer functions, and other things. And you can read all the, the things that it can, can do. Uh, but some pretty powerful capabilities built into uh, the PNM section of the 3.1 phi spec. So here are some of those hooks that I've mentioned. Downstream symbol capture, so you can you capture a symbol coming out of the CMTS and then, and then capture the same symbol at the input to a cable modem and compare the two, and you can see frequency response and other impairments in the network. Wideband spectrum analysis, the, uh, the uh, current generation of cable modems have silicon in them that basically turn the, the CPE into a spectrum analyzer. It uses a, a feature called FBC or full band capture. It captures the RF spectrum and to pull that data out, you get a graphical display of what looks like a spectrum analyzer plot. Channel estimate coefficients, that's your downstream equalizer response, constellation display, MER per subcarrier. Somebody asked me during the break, how can you measure the MER in your OFDM channel? Well, the cable modem does it for you. Already does that today on every subcarrier. I don't know that you necessarily want to look at 7, 000, almost 8,000 MER values for a downstream channel uh, and what most of the, the, uh, the cable test equipment that has this capability and it does is actually plot a graph. So there's a graph of, of MER versus subcarriers. And you see a nice graph of the, on there and you can see what the MER looks like. Uh, so some pretty cool capabilities for troubleshooting the plant. Forward error correction statistics, correctable and uncorrectable code words. Something to get used to in DOCSIS 3.1. I know that, that BER, bit error ratio, has been a troubleshooting metric in DOCSIS 3.0 and earlier, pretty much going back all the way to DOCSIS 1.0. And our, our techs are trained to look at the instruments and look at prefect bit errors and postfect bit errors. And of course, the ideal, the ideal scenario is no prefect errors, no postfect errors. Or if they're prefect errors, hopefully there are no postfect errors because that would mean the forward error correction is fixing them. But if you have prefect errors, you would say, well, why? Better go out and find out what might be causing the prefect errors. Well, in the world of DOCSIS 3.1, you're going to find that there will almost always be correctable code word errors and almost always no uncorrectable code word errors. Don't worry about the, un or about the correctable code word errors. Generally, they're supposed to be there. That's just part of the process. And it's going to be, it's going to be a new mindset for the cable industry to get used to the idea that, wait a minute, I got these correctable code word errors. Shouldn't I go find out what's causing that and fix it? Well, don't worry about it. What you should be concerned with is uncorrectable code word errors. There shouldn't be any. The one thing you may want to look at, and uh, I don't know to what extent the test equipment <coughs> supports this. Now, some instruments do, but I don't know that all do, is the number of LDPC iterations. That's a really useful troubleshooting metric because a low number indicates that, okay, things are, are not too bad and the forward error correction is not having to work too hard. But a large number of iterations means that the forward error correction is having to work a lot harder. So there's some new metrics and some new ways of thinking the cable industry is going to have to get used to when it comes to troubleshooting. Histogram is a good way to detect if you've got um, nonlinearities in the plant, such as laser clipping or amplifier compression, and then receive power at the cable modem at the RF signal level. Uh, use cases, I'm not going to read through the, the table here, 
There's an example of uh, the symbol capture. So there's a, the symbol, so a full 192 megahertz wide um, chunk of that spectrum um, during one symbol, nice and clean at the output of the CMTS, and this is what it might look like at the input to a cable modem. So you capture the same symbol and say, oh, I've got obviously a, an issue here. So there's a pretty powerful troubleshooting tool right there. Uh, there's the histogram. Um, now this, is a, this is a computed histogram, but ideally it would look like this. If you've got laser clipping, you'll see the spike on one side of it. Now, in reality, there have been some tests done, and it looks mostly like the simulation, and it's actually not a nice clean spike like this, but if you've got laser clipping or amplifier compression going on, you'll see this spike like this, and it could be on both sides of the histogram, depending on the nature of the clipping. But a very powerful tool. It's an easy way to check to see if, if, if you've got clipping going on, upstream and downstream. Um, the extension to the 3.1 PNM is um, the spectrum of the upstream band at the cable modem. So there's an example of it. Uh, in this case, it's using the full band capture functionality to capture not only the downstream spectrum, but also the upstream spectrum. And depending on the implementation in the modem, you may be looking through the diplex filter or you may not. Okay, I know I didn't push that. So here you can see impulse noise. There's your four um, legacy signals in the upstream, um, maybe some switching power supply noise, elevated noise floor. Um, but this, this is a good way to look at the return path spectrum at the customer's home. And you think, oh, wait a minute. The, uh, the reverse funneling effect in the upstream mean, it means I should really be looking for noise at the node or the, the head end. Well, yeah, you could, but where's it coming from? You don't know. So if you could look at the individual cable modem, now granted, the, uh, the noise, let's say, coming out of that subscriber drop is you know, going to be heading upstream, but some of it's going to jump the isolator or the two-way splitter. So let's, let's pretend that, that Mark is a TV set with a loose F connector. Roger's the cable modem. And there's a two-way splitter back here. So the, the noise from you know, power line or something else in Mark's house is getting in through his loose F connector, goes back up the upstream to the head end, and of course messes up the entire node. But some of that noise crosses the isolation of the two-way splitter and comes back down here to Roger, where he's able to see this. Yet the next door neighbor doesn't show that elevated noise. So right away, you have identified the potential location where noise is getting into a particular subscriber drop. And you check the other modems in, in the neighborhood around there, and they all look pretty good, except this one address. So you send the tech to Mark's house, you make an appointment with the customer, tighten the loose F connector, and the problem is fixed. This is an incredibly powerful tool supported in uh, 3.1. There are the hooks for the upstream, active and quiet probes, triggered spectrum analysis in the CMT, excuse me, CMTS. The MIBs were just um, finished up for this a while back. Impulse noise statistics, equalizer coefficients, forward error correction statistics, the histogram like we had in the downstream channel power and the uh, MER per subcarrier, same thing as the downstream. Use case example and the summary right here. So we've got new physical layer in DOCSIS 3.1, OFDM, OFDMA, LDPC, higher modulation orders, new spectrum usage options. Keep in mind you don't have to upgrade the network to deploy it. Um, eventually you could scale to full spectrum usage with DOCSIS 3.1, where it does everything. Scale to 10 plus gigabits per second in the downstream, a gigabit or more per second in the upstream. Fiber to the home equivalent at a lower price using your HFC network. Makes our HFC architectures pretty competitive for the foreseeable future. And good news, I've mentioned on multiple occasions, it's deployable in today's networks. You don't have to go out and rebuild the plant in order to deploy this. So with that, let me see if we have any questions.